Hi all, hope you've been staying safe and well. Uh, today's lesson we're going to be focusing on one of the most important scenes in the play, which is the first meeting between Romeo and Juliet. So this occurs at the very, very end of Act 1 in Act 1, Scene 5. Um, the foreshadowing at the start of the play, all the tension and the drama that's been built up, the scene setting that Shakespeare has done as in introducing these two characters and introducing the conflict in their lives has all been leading up to this point. So this is a really, really crucial scene. Uh, there's lots of very interesting uses of language and lots of uses of stagecraft and foreshadowing uh, what's going to happen for the rest of the play. Obviously, this is um, the character's first meeting, so it's really crucial that we get an understanding of how they behave towards each other, what actually drives these characters uh, to take the actions that they do for the rest of the play. Okay, so if we think about what we know so far, in Act 1, Scene 1, Shakespeare has set the scene of these two conflicting families, Romeo's family, the Montagues, and Juliet's family, the Capulets, who despise each other because of this ancient grudge, which is now um, broken out into new mutiny on the streets, this brawling, this fighting. There's been a decree now that any further fighting is going to lead to, um, to imprisonment and death. It's going to lead to executions. Anybody who now disturbs the peace of the streets is going to be executed. We see Romeo introduced, who is lovesick. He is lamenting the loss of Rosaline, who's his love. And he feels like he's never going to be able to love again. He uses this contradictory language of things like cold fire, warm ice, um, bright smoke. This language of confusion. He doesn't really understand what's going on. And to help him, his friends have suggested going to the Capulet's party to be able to... Um, to uh, get over his, his love and his loss. Juliet is in a position where she's been told that she is to be marrying Paris and that um, Paris is looking to marry her. She's not sure about this, but she's going to go to the party to be able to um, meet him and find out what he's like and see, and see about Paris. The whole purpose of this party is for Juliet to meet and hopefully fall in love with Paris. As an audience, hopefully, we're starting to think, actually, this is probably very unlikely to happen. Um, so as we're going to go through it, we're going to talk through different aspects of the scene. Please um, be making your own notes as you go through. I can't recommend highly enough the No Fear Shakespeare website because that has the modern translation side by side. And I am going to be using some clips from that today to help to look at certain aspects of language. So I hope it's really useful. Okay, so it's, it's quite a long scene, uh, Act 1, Scene 5, so we're not going to discuss everything that happens in it. Um, the first major event occurs at line 40. The first 40 lines are essentially servants milling around and Capula getting ready for the party, Lord Capula giving instructions out. At line 40, we have the entrance of Romeo, and uh, obviously he's snuck into this party. He's not meant to be there, he's a Montague, he's the enemy of the Capulets, he's not allowed into this party, he certainly shouldn't have an invitation. So he sneaks in and the first thing he asks is, what lady is that who doth enrich the hand of yonder knight? Now, we know he's speaking of Juliet. Um, he's looking across the, uh, the party and he's seen Juliet. He says that the lady enriches the hand of yonder knight. So the, she is making um, Paris richer by her being there. So Romeo is immediately infatuated with Julia. He sees her as something that's rich and something that is um, precious to him. Which obviously that's really, really important. The servant responds with, I know not, sir. He, the servant's busy, the servant's doing other things, so he, he doesn't know who this is. Um, and then Romeo launches into a speech which describes Julia. He says, she doth teaches the torches to burn bright. It seems she hangs upon the cheek of night like a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. Beauty too rich for use for earth too dear. She shows a snowy dove trooping with crows. As yonder lady over her fellow shows, the measures done, I watch her to the place of stand, and touching hers make blessed my rude hand. Did my heart love till now forswear its sight, for I never saw true beauty till this night. Now there's a lot we can pick out from this, we're going to take a few of the images and a few of the ideas and explore them in a bit of detail. The first one is the first couple of lines where he says, 
she does teach the torches to burn bright. She, throughout the play, we'll see lots of references to Romeo talking about light imagery when referring to Juliet. In this sense, he's saying that she would be able to teach a torch how to be bright, that she lights up the room. Similarly, further down, he says, like a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. He's describing Juliet like a jewel, like a diamond in an earring. So he's saying that she is precious, she is valuable, she's something that's glistening and, and bright. Um, again, using this light imagery. Um, he says that she is for rich, too rich for use, for earth too dear. He's describing her as almost angelic, as if she's not of this earth. She's something beyond that. She's something like an angel rather than being something for earth. And she is like a snowy dove trooping with crows. Now, again, we talked already about Romeo using um, juxtapositions, using opposites. So here he's saying that she is like a dove, obviously very white and pure bird, compared to a crow, which is dark and black. And everyone else is like the crows, and she is the dove who is white and bright. Um, he asks that he will place his hand and make blessed my rude hand. The fact that he's even going to touch her hand is going to make him blessed and feel that he's received some sort of blessing from her. And he ends with this rhetorical question where he's asking himself, Did my heart love till now? For I never saw true beauty till this night. He says that his sight has been tricking him all these years, so Rosalind is completely forgotten now. This is um, someone who is new. This is something that is true beauty that he has not seen until now. Uh, and the fact he's asking himself these questions shows his um, complete lack of understanding of love up until this point. So as Romeo finishes his, um, she does teach the torches to burn bright and the fact that he's never seen true love until this night. He's, when he finishes that speech, he is recognised. Now he's recognised from across the room by Tybalt, probably the last person that he would want to be recognised by. Um, we know that Tybalt from the opening scene is hot-headed. We know that he, he said to, uh, to Benvolio that he hates hell, all Montagues, and thee, and peace. So we have this absolute person who is the worst person to be stirring up and antagonising. He says um, that by his voice should be a Montague. So he immediately recognises that this is Romeo and asks his servant, fetch me my rapier, go get my sword. Um, he says that Romeo has come to fleer and scorn our solemnity, that Romeo is there to um, to take the, the, the mick, essentially, to um, to mock the Capulets by sneaking into the party. And I think that is sort of what he's done. He has, like, um, taken... Um, he has snuck in. He's an uninvited guest. And Tybalt says that to strike him dead, I would hold it not a sin. He's ready to kill Romeo for this insult that he's perceiving. However, Lord Capulet is much more reasoned and much more logical. He says, content thee, gentle cause, let him alone. As in, Tybalt, calm yourself down, we are going to leave him alone. We are going to, um, we can deal with this at another time. I'm not going to have my party spoiled. He says, I would not for the wealth of all the town here in my house do him disparagement. He's saying, this party is for, for, for me and my guests and we are not going to spoil it with violence. Lord Capulet here being much more reasonable and much more aware of the consequences of fighting and insulting um, and, and insulting than uh, Tybalt is. Tybalt's ready to brawl, ready to fight, whereas Lord Capulet is much more reasoned. Tybalt tries to reason with him and tries to get again to be more aggressive. He says, my uncle tis a shame, but Capulet gets angry and says, go to, go to, stop with this behaviour. Um, we're not going to be fighting here. Um, he says, be quiet. More light, more light, for shame, I will make you quiet. Lord Capulet is using his status here to say to Tybalt, look, I am in charge, this is my party, I am not going to have it spoiled by you fighting. As Lord Capulet moves away, however, Tybalt swears revenge on Romeo. He says, patience, poor fans, with the willful collar meeting, makes my flesh tremble in their different greeting. I will withdraw. But this intrusion shall now seeming sweet convert to bitterest gall. Tybalt is foreshadowing here. He's saying, I'm ready to 
bite you and it will in one time it seems sweet now it seems sweet and it seems good that you're at this party but it will convert to this bitter stomach acid of gall at some point in the future i'm going to remember this and i will come and get my revenge so this is foreshadowing um problems later on in the play between romeo and tybalt Okay, so as Tybalt moves away and withdraws, Romeo is free to go and speak to Juliet. And at this point, we need to know a little bit of context. So, um, pilgrims on the road would perform something called a palmer's kiss. Um, so this is where you would greet someone with the palm of your hand. You would touch hand to hand, palm to palm, palmer's kiss. And the idea is that um, it's a holy way of greeting each other. A sort of a religious way of greeting each one another not romantic it's like a religious greeting and it's the palm to palm it's holy palmer's kiss so romeo when he meets juliet says this i profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine the gentle sin is this my lips to blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough act with a tender kiss so what he's essentially saying is that by touching her palm with his palm he's actually tainting a holy shrine. So again, we have this religious imagery around Juliet that she's holy, that she's like a shrine, she's like a religious place, and that Romeo is making her tainted by the fact that he's touching her. But he also uses a sort of cheeky pun and says that he has two, his lips are like two pilgrims ready to make the journey as well into this holy shrine. So he's ready to kiss her properly. Juliet now responds, and because Juliet's quite like fiercely independent, and because she is a little bit more. Um, there's probably a little more, bit more about her than some of the other girls. She doesn't immediately let Romeo kiss her. She says, Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much. With manly devotion shows this. For saints of hands that pilgrims' hands do touch. And palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. So she says the, the palmer's kiss is more special because it is a holy kiss. Romeo continues to try and seduce Juliet by saying, Have not saints lips and holy palmers too. And Juliet responds with lips they must use in prayer. So what we're seeing is this sort of flirtatious banter between the two of them. Um, the, the, Romeo is trying to seduce her, trying to steal a kiss from her. And Juliet is actually saying, trying to respond and trying to make him work harder for this. Um, so Romeo says, Dear saint, let lips do what hands do too. They pray grant thou lest faith turn to despair. Now, what we have is Romeo actually pleading with Juliet that this is something that, um, that would be needed, that this is um, making the world right by doing this. Um, it's like a plea, a prayer that he's giving towards Juliet. What we can immediately see here is that they have this immediate connection um, right from the very, very first meeting. If we look at the way that they speak, they're speaking in rhyme. So... Um, that gives a sense of completeness, a sense of wholeness, and quite often um, they're finishing off each other's lines and they're responding in ways that indicate that these two are a perfect match for one another. If we look at Romeo, for example, in his first speech, we have the end of the line, hand, uh, this, and then stand and kiss. This complete, perfect rhyme when he's speaking about Juliet gives a sense of um, completeness and wholeness and a sense of that he is... Um, totally besotted and in love with her. Okay, ultimately, Juliet then backs down and we have, Saints do not move though grant for prayer's sake. Romeo, then move not while my prayer's effect I take. And they kiss. Um, he, Romeo says that from my lips by thine my sin is purged. So again we've got Romeo using this imagery of himself as someone who is sinful, as someone who is tainted and that Juliet is more holy and special and that she's taken the sin from him. Um, then Juliet says, my lips the sin they have took, sin from my lips or trespass sweetly urged, give me my sin again and then they kiss again. We have this continuous religious imagery that their, their love is perfect, their love is um, divine, and their love is blessed by God. Um, at this point, they are taken apart. Juliet says, you kiss by the book, and the nurse interrupts with, Madam, your mother craves a word with you. And Juliet begins to move away. Romeo asks, what is her mother? So who is her mother?
Okay, so the climax of Act 1 and the climax of Act 1, Scene 5 in particular, is the two lovers realising that they come from feuding families, that they come from um, the two sides of the argument, and they are um, doomed to hate each other. They should be hating each other, and now they've fallen so deeply and immediately in love with each other. Uh, this is going to be problematic. So we start with Romeo saying, Is she a Capulet or dear account? My life is in my forced debt. Meaning, my hands and uh, my life is now in the hands of my enemy. I'm in a debt to my foe. Um, Benvolio comes and says, "A way be gone. The sport is at its best. The fact that we have to leave now, we have to immediately leave this party." And Romeo responds with, "I so I fear. The more is my unrest." Um, so Romeo is now troubled in his mind. He's troubled by what he has learned about Juliet. Juliet again responds in a similar way. Um, uh, initially she tries asking about all the different men and the nurse tries to distract her by offering her different men around the room but ultimately she says if he be married my grave is like to be my wedding bed she says that she would rather die than marry anybody else now and the nurse ultimately relents and tells her that his name is Ro Romeo and a Montague the only son of your great enemy Judy has a fantastic line now. She says, my only love sprung from my only hate. So now she's starting to use this idea of contradictory language that we've seen from Romeo already. Um, too early seen unknown and known too late. So known at the wrong time in the wrong place. I must love a loathed enemy. So Romeo's already talked about four and now Julia is talking about an enemy. So we can see this idea of love and hate, love and violence being parallel throughout the play. Um, the nurse tries to respond with what's this, what's this um, and Juliet tries to um, reassure her but it ends with um, the nurse and Juliet exiting together um, at the end of the party the end of the scene is now setting up this conflict between the love of Romeo and Juliet and the hatred of the rest of their families. How are these two lovers going to react to what they've just found out? The fact that they've fallen so deeply and madly in love with each other and that they're from these two opposing sides of a great conflict. Okay, two things that I would like you to have a look at today. The first of which is to use the link at the bottom of this video to have a read through the No Fear Shakespeare, which is the things that have been popping up throughout this video. They are really, really useful, especially reading it side by side, and so you can see what the Shakespearean language is um, I'm trying to say in, the, in modern English. It's a really, really good strategy to do that. The second thing is to have a look at some of the quotations in depth and have a consider about how the initial meeting of Romeo and Juliet is presented. So looking at some of the most important lines from within this, and these are the ones that I've been speaking about. So things like, um, she doth teach the torches to burn bright would be a fantastic start. My only love sprung from my only hate. Um, she, snowy dove uh, trooping amongst crows. Uh, there's the lots and lots of different imagery and ideas that we can use there. So you're going to pick at least 10 of these quotations and annotate and, uh, and give as much inferences and deductions that you can about those particular quotations. Uh, stay tuned to the end one of today's book recommendation. Today's film recommendation, I'm going to uh, be recommending a sci-fi epic, uh, one of which has had several different cuts, um, and the director is never quite happy with what he's managed to do, but it's a fantastic story about identity and about um, who we really are, and that's Blade Runner. Um, a really, really interesting dystopian landscape, really uh, exciting, 
um, story and narrative and the whole central question of who we are and what makes us human is a massive theme and um, so go and check it out it's really really good uh, next time we'll be moving on to look at act two and looking at romeo and juliet and their continued meetings uh, despite now finding out who they are and who which families they belong to uh, so until then take care